and welcome to today's SQL Office Hours session. Now, with the world kind of starting to return back to normal and people actually starting to be able to go out again and meet up, I thought actually, we're, rather than talk about databases for a bit, um, we could try and organize um, an international five-a-side competition for the Oracle user groups, right? Um, what, a, what a great way to celebrate um, actually being able to go out again. Okay, maybe not. I'm not sure tech and five-a-side competitions necessarily go together that well, but let's run through some examples. I'll have a, some examples of some data that we're going to store on some teams. Um, I'll, there'll be some people in here. You might recognize some names. Of course, this is entirely coincidental it's, if that happens to be the case, but um, we're just using these as an example. So I built a little Apex app to kind of store details of the matches, who's playing in them, the results of them, and so on and so forth. And at first glance, everything looks all right. But then actually you start to look at this data a little bit more closely. So we can see for each team, we've got a comma separated list of the players in each one. So that brings some interesting questions. Well, how do we do things like report on which games individual players are playing in? Um, and there's some other interesting things going on here. Well, we've got the Stadion Berlin is apparently located in both Berlin and London. That doesn't seem right, right? And if we look at these um, scores here, we've got our goals away, home and away, and a, a goal difference. So we've got a draw here, but apparently there's a goal difference of six. Hmm, seems someone's added those numbers rather than subtracting them. So we've got a whole bunch of data errors going on here. Um, so what do we need to do about it? So we can avoid or resolve a lot of these by normalizing the tables. So that's what we're going to go through. We're going to walk through this um, data and kind of improve it as we go along. And we're looking at today, we're just looking at the first normal forms one to three. There are more beyond this. I think that's all we're really going to have time to discuss today. But this should at least give you a grounding of the basics and some of the things that you want to think about when you're designing your tables and figuring out how to actually store your data. So hi, everyone. I'm Chris Saxon. I'm part of Gerald Wenzel's Developer Africa team. And it's my job to help you get the best out of Oracle database and hopefully have a little bit of fun whilst doing so. So with that in mind, it's always great to be here with these office hour sessions. It's a bit of a chance to interact, particularly in these strange days when we're all mostly stuck at home a lot of the time. So as I said, Please put your questions in the Q&A window and I'll address them as I can as we go through the session. So let's return to normalization. Now, there's a good chance that you've heard the little rhyme when it comes to the first three normal forms. And that is describing things as the key, the whole key, and then nothing but the key. And while this is kind of handy to help you remember what they are, if you're not familiar with them, you're kind of a bit stuck, right? It doesn't really explain it in more concrete terms of what it is you're actually supposed to do. So let's discuss them in a bit more detail. Now, the first thing to notice is that there's normal forms. They're generally numbered, starting at one, going up two, three, um, up to five, and even beyond that. They are increasing levels of conformance. So we start off in first normal form, then also in second and third and so on. Now, note, in order to meet a higher normal form, you have to have also met all the preconditions for the lower normal forms. It's possible you've met the conditions for the higher one. If you haven't met the conditions for the lower normal form, then actually you're still, you know, the, the data is in that lower form or the form below it, in fact. So they are increasing levels of compliance. So let's walk through our data set again. And we'll start with our comma separated list of names. So we've just got a one in each column, we've got our home and away players, and we're storing a comma separated list of values. So let's start by looking at how we can fix that by discussing first normal form. So this was something that uh, the uh, relational model and normal forms was something that was first developed by Ted Codd way back in 1970. And he had this to say about uh, first normal form. You know, the row and column stores atomic values. There are no repeating groups, which, you know, sounds kind of sage and useful and interesting. But actually, when you think about it, these terms atomic and repeating groups are kind of vague and a bit confusing, and it's not sure exactly what they mean. Um, 
And there's a lot of articles about normalization around which either just kind of skip over this completely, um, talk about the same things are just completely wrong, or just kind of muddy the water and don't kind of, kind of confuse things a bit. So what I wanted to do is kind of focus on why we're doing the things, the kind of problems we're trying to prevent by reaching various normal forms, um, rather than necessarily the strict definitions themselves to kind of say, well, this is an, what's an issue, why it's an issue, and how we can resolve it. So the key point and the big reason COD came up with the relational model and normalization was to avoid data errors. So this is when you've got mistakes in values that you're storing in your data. So they don't follow the business rules that you conform to. And this is really common if you're duplicating data. You're to storing the same set of information twice or three times. It's likely that at some point you're going to have a mismatch or a mistake. So normalization is the point of reducing these to um, improve the quality of your data and therefore you know your ability to actually use your applications so let's look at our teams let's just home in on um, a couple of them and a couple of teams and we can see we've got our comma separated list of values now this causes a lot of problems you know those of you who are experienced database professionals will know there's a whole host of issues that can arise here first up um, perhaps most basically what if we want to report on a particular player? Player, you know, find out find out which team they're on or what position they're playing in, that kind of thing. Well, now you've got to do a like expression. You know, you've got to do is this column like percent and do the wild cards and things like that. So it's actually pretty tricky to pull information out about a particular person. Also, if we want to report on all the individuals in a team. You know, how do we split them out? How do we get them into columns or into rows? We've got to do all sorts of string manipulation, which gets gets messy and a bit tricky to deal with. But even trickier than that, it comes in, what if we want to actually change the players on a team? You know, we want to say that Niels is no longer on the Diag team and he's moved to a different one or something like that. How do we do that? How do we update this? Okay, um, we've got to do some string manipulation here, probably to kind of pull that out or replace it. You know, whatever, however you think about it, if we want to change just one individual on a team, it's actually pretty fiddly to do this when it's just one big long string of data. Um, and of course, there's the issue of duplicates. You know, so there's a couple of things. I mean by this. First up, with that UKOG team, we've got a big long list of Martins. Um, I'll put aside the kind of complications of knowing whether or not these are actually different people or just, you know, uh, one person called Martin or five different people with the name Martin. But even re regardless of that, how do we check or enforce that these are in fact different people? You know, we haven't got the same person um, occupying all five positions on the team. If, I'm not even sure how you'd go about doing that. So storing um, these things as a common separated list introduces problems. And when it comes to duplicates, there's another kind of more subtle issue. And let's say we have another kind of DOAG team. We've got the same players, but just in it, or the same names, but just in a different order. Is that the same team or a different team? Hmm, right? It's like, mm, yeah, I'm not sure. It kind of depends, right? It depends on whether the order they're positioned in within that string has meaning or not. And it's like, okay. So doing this has a whole bunch of problems. And they say there's a thing that hopefully, you know, most database professionals learn very, very early on is that this is a bad idea. And a lot of people kind of thought about um, COD's model and things that he proposed. Foremost among those was Chris Date. And one of the things is like, well, this notion of atomic, you know, what does that mean? We, can, we can't split it down. Can you split down a string? We could say we could even store um, a string as each individual character. I mean, that probably doesn't make much sense in most real world systems. So what we want to say is each row and column. So, you know, if you're like in an Excel um, spreadsheet, each cell um, stores a single value. So we're just storing one value. So in this case, we will have a separate row and column for each player, not a big long long string of things. Now, he did have one a kind of little important extension to this that he says is 
that also means that you would have no nulls stored. Now, this is controversial for various reasons, um, and it's a big topic, which I don't really have time to go into today, other than what I will say is you do want to avoid storing nulls as much as possible. But in practical terms, there are a lot of situations where you know, it, the workarounds to avoid them become much more complicated. So you do want to avoid nulls as much as possible. Um, but as I say, in practice, there are various times when the way things work at the moment, it is difficult to avoid them. So we want to store a single value. So I'm actually going to shift examples slightly. So let's imagine you've got a, some kind of registration form or things like that. And it's quite common when you're signing up for services or entering your details for them to um, ask for contact details, things like your address, um, your phone number, and so on. And quite often they'll ask for multiple phone numbers, right? They'll say, give us a primary phone number, a second phone number, and so on and so forth. Now, one way we could address this is to store those two phone numbers is to do something like this. We can have for each person and their account, we can have a column for each phone number. So there's a couple of issues with this. First up, and perhaps most obviously from what you can see here, is that some people may only have or only be willing to give you one phone number, which of course then means we have to store null for that second phone number, okay? So by doing this, you know, if, unless we enforce that people have to supply two phone numbers, which could be a business rule that we have, but unless we enforce that, it's quite likely that um, some of these columns will have null. But there's also a more interesting and a more subtle problem. What happens if user two wants to remove this phone number? You know, they, it's not their number anymore, so they want to remove it from their account. Well, what does that mean for the data we're storing here, right? Um, have we said there's some kind of ordering to these numbers? You know, is phone number one the primary one and phone number two the secondary? Do we need to, you know, remove that phone number and copy the second number into it? It's not entirely clear. Um, and whatever you do here, again, it's just a bit of a mess and a bit fiddly. And kind of the problem here is we've sort of implicitly said there is some order to the values in, as we're storing in the columns here. So um, Date again, he's thought about this a bit further and he said, you shouldn't impose any left to right ordering on the columns. So if you've got things where it says like, um, you know, phone one, phone two, phone three, et cetera, that's probably, probably a bad idea. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you couldn't have two columns to store the phone number. If instead of calling them phone number one and phone number two, what you did is said, well, this is your home phone number and this is your work phone number. Well, actually, that's fine. Um, we've got the issue of nulls here again. We'll say, let's just imagine we live in a world where um, we're saying you have to provide both of these. Then actually, it kind of does make sense to have two different things here. You know, um, your work phone number, you would probably only call someone that during typical office hours, you know, Monday, Friday, nine to five, the home phone number, you're more likely to call, use that at other times. So there's actually some different context to the values here. So we could do something like this, but actually typically we'd kind of pivot this a bit further. Rather than having column for each phone number, what we'd introduce is a type column and store these as separate rows. So we'd say for each user, what type of phone number? Is it their home phone number? Is it their work number? and which phone number it is, and so on. So and bigger, this has a few advantages of storing them as separate columns. Firstly, if someone only has or is only willing to give you one of the other numbers, we don't have to worry about nulls. Um, but secondly, we can now have many different, many different numbers for each person. Instead of being limited to two, we could store as many as we want, really, right? So we can have an unlimited number of phone numbers for each person, depending on what other business rules we apply, of course. Now, at this point, we're doing much better, but there's still an issue here, and that is we could actually store two roles which are identical, right? So we've got user two, exactly the same home phone number. Um, and this then becomes a problem when you're processing the data. You know, you're working on something, which records do you select? 
you select one and they edit it and they save it back down. Should you do the same with the other one? Uh, you know, it's not really clear here. So again, um, we don't want things like this and we should also avoid storing duplicate rows, okay? So we want to stop, you know, people storing identical information twice. And the question here is, well, how do we do this? How do we stop people um, storing duplicate information? Well, in databases today, relational databases, there are two um, approaches. There's primary keys and unique constraints. Superficially, these are very similar in that they enforce uniqueness. So only one row can have each um, set of values in those columns. But there are some subtle yet important differences. Notably, you can only have one primary key on a table. There are lots of situations where there will be multiple keys that you could have on a table. So if you've got more than one, you need to have unique constraints as well. There is another subtle difference between them as well, at least in Oracle database. And that is that primary keys are implicitly mandatory. That is, you can never store nulls in the columns of a primary key um, it, that make up a primary key constraint. You can store null values in the columns of a uh, in the column in the columns that make up a unique constraint unless you add the not null constraint as well on top of that. Okay, so some little subtle differences that is important to be aware of. Okay, so we want to um, avoid duplicates. Now at this point, what some people do is kind of go well. Um, okay, we need a primary key. I uh, hear surrogate keys are a good thing. So we'll just add a surrogate primary key to the table, which is, you know, sequence defined or something like this, and say, and kind of declare victory and go, well, like, we're done here, right? I mean, yeah, you can do this. And there's lots of good reasons why you might want to use surrogate keys, but they have no effect on normalization, none whatsoever. If we look at the real business data here, you know, the usernames, their phone numbers and their types, we can still um, actually store duplicate information, right? So the only thing that's changing here is some kind of synthetic value we have made up. We want to avoid these kind of problems. So lots of good reasons you might wanna have some surrogate keys in your implementation, but it is nothing to do with normalization. What we need to look at instead are candidate keys or business keys. There's a lot of people have various terms that they use for use um, for this. But what I mean here is the smallest set of columns you can use to uniquely identify a row. So if we go back to our um, users and their phone numbers, we could just make every column in the table part of the primary or unique constraint. But that introduces an interesting problem. So user two has entered the same number phone number twice for both home and work. Now, does that really make sense? Hmm, it depends, you know? I mean, you could argue, yes, they use the same number for both, but from a business perspective, you probably you may not want them to actually store the same number twice, because again, it can cause issues of what do they want to change with it? Um, who, how do we know what to contact and so on? You might say that, each person in each, each account can only have one, uh, can only use each phone number listed once. So to avoid this, we'd say one of the keys here is in fact just username and phone number. And we'd uh, apply the appropriate constraints on that. Also note, we've allowed a person to enter two work phone numbers here. Again, is this something that you wanna allow? Well, I have two work phone numbers. I've got my um, cell phone and my desk phone. Um, so maybe, maybe not, you know, it's kind of a business decision here. Do you want to pick, say that people can have multiple phone numbers of each type? It might be a key, it might not be, depends on the business rules and constraints. So that's kind of like a, a tour through first normal form. Um, so how do we use this, what we've just talked about here to store our teams and our five-a-side league you know, where we started? We've got our um, comma separated list of players, Clearly, we don't want to do that. Well, the basic approaches we can use here are we can split them up into columns. So we have a column for each player, or we can create a row for each one. So we could have, um, you know, for each position, we could create a table like this and the goalkeeper, defender, and so on, and say who is in each one. 
or we could introduce a position column and say who is in that position. So what do we think? What, what do you think at this point? Which um, approach do you prefer? Which do you think is better? Which would you go for? Uh, just while, uh, while you ponder that. So it, just quickly in the chat, just kind of say um, R uh, for rows, C for columns, if you've got goalkeeper, defender and so on for columns or rows. Um, I see there's a comment from Aaron. Unique key with multiple column, columns cannot have null, right? No, you can have null in a unique constraint unless you have actually added the not null um, property on the, those columns. And, you know, at least in Oracle database, unless you have applied that um, not null constraint to the columns themselves, you can have nulls within the columns of a unique key, okay? That is entirely possible. Okay, so Neil's going for the second version as you can easily add more rows. Uh, KB row, indirect, it depends, but the right one is more flexible. Second approach, the position solution. Yeah, so so far people have seem to be favoring the position solution, right? As Neil says, you, it makes it easier to add new positions. So a few things to note here. Both of these designs actually meet first normal form, or at least as we discussed it. We've got unique constraints, so we can't have duplicates. We can enforce that they're all mandatory, avoid nulls, um, so we've avoided duplicates. We haven't you know, imposed any particular ordering on the columns. They are all, all positions. So in terms of normalization, these are both kind of valid. But in terms of what you're going to do with it and your business rules, well, there's different reasons for doing this. And as most people seem to be preferring the position um, type solution. And you know, there's good reasons for doing that, but it is worth remembering that the column-based approach does have a couple of good big advantages, actually. Um, we are storing a five-a-side league, and that is what we're designing, and that is what we're building. We can ensure with those five columns, make them all not null, that we always have exactly five players on every single team. Right. As things stand currently, in at least in Oracle database and most other databases too, it is very, very tricky to ensure that every team has exactly five players on it. There are ways to do it, but it all is just a bit fiddling. So if you know you're building a five-a-side league and you're only ever going to have a five-a-side league, then um, this could be the way to do it. Another kind of more minor benefit is if we want to get all the players on a team, then we're just accessing one row. Whereas if we've got the position column, we're accessing five rows. In some scenarios, in some situations, there could be a performance benefit to accessing just one row instead of five. You know, again, this is kind of more of a minor advantage um, and will depend on a lot, what of what you, a lot of what you're actually doing. But it is something worth bearing in mind. <laughs> Aaron, what about the substitutes? Oh, that's a great question. You know, how do we swap people in and out? Um, I'll, I'll let you ponder that and think about what you're going to do here. Okay. So why do we go with? Why do people say the position column? Well, this, and you know, I must admit, I would favour the position column as well. Generally, you know, if I was building a system. So one of the big reasons is if we want to um, join to a separate players table. So there's a good chance that we'll actually have a separate table storing player details and we'll just have like a player ID in those columns, uh, in that, the player columns in the teams. If we've got five columns and they're all storing player IDs in and we want to join to a player's table, you've got to write five joins, okay? It's just more work and it makes queries a bit more cumbersome. Whereas if you've just got one player column, it's just one join to write. Secondly, um, and perhaps very interestingly, is it's much easier to enforce uniqueness when you've just got one player column per team. There's a couple of rules which could apply. Well, there's, there's one which almost certainly applies. A person can only play in one position on a team at a time, right? You know, if we had those five Martins, they have to be different people. One person played Martin, called Martin can't play all five positions on the same team. If they are separate columns within the table, you've got to write some fairly a very comprehensive set of check constraints to avoid that, to prevent people storing the same person twice on a team. Um, very easy with the position column. You just say team name, player, 
that's unique. You can't have the duplicates. But then there's a kind of a more general rule that might apply as well. You know, a player can only play on one team at a time across the entire day set. You know, I can't be assigned to do two different teams at the same time. Again, it's very easy to do that if you've just got the one player column. Just make it unique. We've got the five columns. Again, I, I'm not even sure how you'd do that, really. I'd have to think about it pretty carefully. Um, and as you know, as Niels has said, um, when it comes to extending things, let's say we want to actually expand this to not just be a five-a-side league, but an 11-a-side league, um, or we want to store results for other types of um, sports, like rugby, which has 15-a-side by default, or has rugby sevens and that kind of thing. If we've got rows, then we don't need to make any changes to the schema to support them. We can just, you know, do some, um, perhaps add some more types to the table and things like that, but we don't need to actually make any schema changes. When we've got five columns to go to 11 aside, you've got to change your table, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's... In general, we probably prefer the row-based approach here, position column with the rows. So that's fine when we're talking about the players, but we kind of also have this dilemma with the home and away teams as well. So we could actually do this. There's two approaches we could take here. We could have one row for a match with the home and away team as separate columns, or we could have a home and away type column and have them as separate rows. Which do we think is a better approach here now? Which do you prefer here? Do you prefer the uh, one row with two teams or two rows with one team on each? Hmm, yeah, okay. It's not, I'm not sure which I favour here, to be honest. You know, um, what about you? What do you think? So I see a couple of comments that were in said about substitutes. I mean, we can update. And what about players who can play multiple positions? Well, I guess we're saying this is the squad for a particular team. I mean, there's there's more general question of saying, you know, these are the team positions that they can play in and so on. Um, it's a good question. Um, maybe we could discuss it later. But uh, at the moment, we're saying, like, this is the, the squad that's going to play that particular time. So Schwartz or Bernard preferring the top row. Rachel going for two rows. Yeah, one row. It's, you know, there's argument both ways with this one or it's it's less clear cut i mean if we think like in terms of extensibility and changing this um it is you know a football side and in fact most team sports are defined as being played by two teams right if it was chain it would be at a complete change in every world as we know it if there was three teams playing a match at one time right i mean I know people set up weird leagues that do things like that, but in standard sports, it, it basically never happens. So in terms of extensibility, we probably don't have to worry about that. We need to think more about kind of um, what, uh, you know, what the business requirements are, what kind of questions do we need to answer from the data and what we're doing here. So Chris, less data store with one row. Um, Aaron, so it's better to be generic. I'm not sure what you mean by that. Aaron, um, if you can explain. So Niels, to combine both approaches, unless the number of players is small enough that you can only, you can also use an object type and a very array of that type with enable storage in row, not unless, but as long as, yeah, okay. Um, uh, neutral venues, oh, you're good at this, Aaron, thinking about all the possibilities here, yeah. So yeah, the thing, you've got to think not just about, uh, you've got to think about the wider business questions and what you're trying to answer here. Two rows in case you play on neutral ground from Christian. Yeah, okay, there's, you know, a lot of tournament, knockout tournaments um, will be played on a neutral ground um, and so on. So yeah, what about playing away? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean about that. But Niels, Niels also, there's an interesting point you make about storing a V-Array. Um, you know, one thing Chris did say is you could actually store a relation in a column. So we could say a team is a V-Array for players and store that in a column. And in some instances, that might be okay. In some instances, that might be what you want to do. 
personally, I think you have to be really very unusual that you would want to do that. And you have to think really hard about the benefits you're getting from doing that. But there are some cases where you might want to do something like that. That is true. Okay. Okay. Any other comments or uh, questions about this before we move on? Uh, ch -ch -ch. Alistair, context matters. Focus of the table is the match. One row. Yeah. Let's, as you say, you've got to really think more about the context here, particularly when it comes to these, um, how you're storing these teams. Uh, Niraj, does MongoDB has much easier and better flexibilities for handling this type of scenarios? Um, in fact, I would say the opposite. I would say MongoDB is less flexible because it's kind of, you're storing things as the document um, and they would just kind of create a matches thing in JSON, um, which magnify, typically magnifies these problems. Or let's put it uh, another way, it is much easier to make get yourselves into these problems without realizing it with storing things as a, in a document database right um which you whereas you have to think about them more explicitly when using oracle databases or similarly relational based databases yeah Petra, no more flexibility you can store everything in one place in oracle too yeah and saying you can you can store json you know, 21 c's just out where we've got the new json data type even before that you could store JSON just in a club or a blob column. We had lots of functionality to help you work with that. Or of course, you could just spray it in and this is CSV or whatever the heck you like. I mean, ultimately, a lot of these things, um, it's up to the people maintaining the application to know what it means and manage them and figure them out, All right? All right, um, okay, let's move on. If you've got more comments, then just feel free to put them, but I think we need to move on or we'll run out of time. So let, let's imagine we've fixed that, or at least we've discussed it, and we will fix it eventually. So let's look at this second problem here. So we've got uh, Stadion Berlin, which is apparently located in both Berlin and London. Let's assume it is, in fact, the same um, location, the same stadium. So this is clearly a problem here, um, and we want to avoid it. So when we, in order to do that, we want to talk about second normal form. And when covering this, we want to talk about functional dependencies. So in relational model and functional dependencies, what we mean is this, we have two values x and y, and we say x determines y if each time you have a value of x, it should have the same y value. Okay, so this is one where I think it really helps to have an example. So we can say that the date determines the day of the week. So today's the 17th of August 2021. Therefore, it is a Tuesday. Every time in your database that you have that date and you're showing the day of the week, you want it to be Tuesday. I mean, okay, you might want to have it in the language specific terms. You might, you know, um, say Dean's tag for German and that kind of thing. But basically, it is always that day of the week. If we store Wednesday or Sunday or, you know, Freitag or something like that, it is wrong. Okay. Um, so, date determines the day of the week. Notice the opposite is not true. Just because it's a Tuesday doesn't mean it's the 17th of August, right? There's um, a practically infinite, you know, there is an infinite number of dates effectively for each Tuesday, okay? So the date determines the day of the week. Um, so let's look at, let's just hone down the matches a bit and we'll just look at the stadium, the date and the city. So we've got two matches here, same pl place, but apparently they are in different cities this is a problem because they, they both represent a geographical feature so the stadium is the you know the precise point and the city is the kind of larger um, geographical area so the stadium determines the city so what's this to do with second normal form well in second normal form what we're saying is all the non-key columns must depend on all of the columns of every key in the table okay um, so if we look back at our table here, the match, we'll just say this key for the table here is the um, location and the date. You know, each location can only host one match at a time. Let's say it's actually date time, you know, we'll have the kickoff time in there as well. So we can only host one match at a time in a particular location, which is a, you know, fairly common sense fact. So that's the key. Those two columns make up the key. And the city is not 
part of that key. You know, there might be multiple, like, there is multiple stadiums in London. I'm sure there's multiple stadiums in Berlin as well. They're both big cities. So there could be multiple games within the city at the same time. So city is not the key for that table. So we've got a functional dependency where only one of the two columns of the key um, determine a non-key value. So we are not in second normal form here. So the question is, well, how do we fix this? How do we resolve it? And um, what we need to do here is decompose the table. So we need to take the parts of the key and the associated columns and create, put them onto a new table. So we can do that here by creating a stadiums table, which stores the city and the matches just stores the stadium and the date. Now there's like a one-to-many relationship. So each stadium could have many matches or will have many matches, probably. So we've defined that, but um, we've introduced a potential issue here. We know which stadium it is, but how do we ensure we always have the city as well? You know, the full address, for example, for that stadium. It's all in the same row, we just make it more mandatory and we kept it. But now we've got the stadium um, details in a separate table. How do we know that for a particular match, we have that stadium and it exists? So how do we ensure this? Well, this is where foreign keys come in. So these define a parent-child relationship. So uh, if we've got our stadiums table, we've got, we'll say stadium ID is our primary key and the stadium name is a unique constraint. Then in the child table, the matches, we have the foreign key from matches to the stadiums. That means we cannot insert a row into the matches table unless there is an associated row with the same value in the stadiums table, okay? So we can't kind of have like these orphaned entries in the matches table. Now, a couple of things to note here. First up, by convention, typically you will point um, foreign keys to the primary key, but you can also um, point them to unique constraints as well. They don't have to go to primary keys. It's just typically we um, actually do that by convention. Second thing is some of you looking at this foreign key constraint very closely might have noticed I haven't actually supplied a data type here. Um, and that is optional, right? When defining a foreign key column, you can just move, uh, omit the data type and it will inherit the data type from the parent column, whatever that is. And you know, in almost all cases, you want the data type of the child table to match the corresponding columns in the parent table. So this, you know, again, it avoids the chance of um, errors creeping in and things like that. So nice little, not only does it save you a bit of typing, it makes it less likely you'll make a mistake and get these out of sync one way or another. Um, so, uh, so we've got, so that's what second normal form is. Um, what about our uh, matches table? What are our partial dependencies? Um, so we've got columns that depend on part of a key. Well, first thing we need to look at is what are our keys so far? So let's, let's say we've got the table like this. I've introduced the position column for the players and I've kept home and away teams as columns. We actually, actually have, we have loads of candidate keys in this table. So a team can only play a at a particular location at a time. So position team and date is a key. Same for player, same for away team, same for home team, same for stadium. There are loads and loads of keys in this table, okay? And there's quite a few um, partial dependencies as well. We've already seen stadium determines the city, so we need a stadiums table. Now, we're in the debate about, you know, those t home and away teams, um, do we store them as separate columns or separate row as columns or rows. If we store them as columns, then the home team, we could argue, determines the stadium, where it is. You know, which now I know some of you put out examples, you know, neutral grounds where that may not be the case, but you know, this comes down to your business rules, what you've decided and what you've determined. In this case, in my in my world, in my example I'm building here, I'm saying this is a business rule. The home team determines the stadium. Therefore, we need a teams table, right, to do that. And of course, um, the position and the team for each uh, team, home and away, determines who is playing in that position. So we need a team players table. So this gives us a schema a little bit like this. So we'd end up something something along these lines in the end. We'd have separate 
tables for the stadiums, the teams, the team players, and the matches. Now, as we've discussed, the exact details, would you build this in your system? Well, it depends. You've got to look at your business needs, your requirements, and so on and so forth. So uh, any other comments or questions on this before we move on? So Neeraj, is it advisable to have a date type column as part of the primary key as a general practice? Well, if it forms part of a unique constraint, then you want to have it as a unique, um, you know, then you need to do that, right? It depends on what your business rules are. Um, so, you, you know, this is where you need to think about what's actually going to happen. Of course, in practice, because, you know, certainly date times could go down to the second or even microsecond, um, just saying, you know, it's kickoff at 8 p.m. and quite unique constraint that on that is not good enough because then, of course, you could store another row which is starts at 8.01 p.m. or 8.02 p.m. Um, so there are kind of issues and things you need to think about here with dates. But yeah, I mean, the thing is, if that is a rule and that's what you want to ensure, if you want to ensure there is only one row for this date with these other properties, you should have a unique constraint on it. When players change in a team, do you create a new team? Okay, good question, Indrek. Well, um, so it, you know, we've got our team players here and we've got our rows. Um, we can just, you know, either delete the existing player and insert the new one or just update them. Again, it's decision. I would say probably not, but it depends on what you want to do here. You know, you've got to also then think about things like, okay, well, maybe we want to know the history, you know, teams change over time. What was the squad last year? This is what, what is the squad this year? These are important questions you need to ask when actually building this for real. Um, they're kind of outside the scope of what I'm going to cover today, but they are important considerations. So Arun, if I want to store pictures of player in blob, we would create another table so we don't need the blob to select all the time. We would create a separate table storing the blobs or just the same table. Um, well, so there's two things there, I guess. One is I haven't at this point created a separate table just for the players and storing their player details, things like their name, their date of birth, any other details we want to store about that. So it is almost certain in a real system, we would have a separate table for the players. Are you then asking if we've got a player's table, do we want a separate table to store the player um, pictures? Probably not. Um, that's, uh, we'll see if we've got time. Maybe we can discuss that a bit more detail later. But certainly, we don't, we don't want to have um, multiple rows with the same picture in multiple times, right? As long as you've got a column um, table that is unique per player, so we only store each picture once, most of the time that's probably good enough. But again, you need to think a bit more about your requirements and so on. All right then, so let's move on. We've still got stuff to carry, cover and we've got uh, 15, 20 minutes left. All right then, so we've, we will address this, we'll fix this um, eventually, these conflict here. Let's move on to the final one here. So we've got a game that's a draw. Um, so the goal difference should be zero, but somehow it's goal difference of six. Someone's added the values instead of subtracting them, right? Okay, um, clearly a bit of a problem here. So at this point, I wanna talk about third normal form. Okay, and this is to do with uh, non-key columns. So any column which are um, part of, not part of any key, and there is a dependency between those, then you are not in third normal form. So if we simplify things a bit, I'll just have a match ID column here, however we've designed it before then. We've got our home goals, our away goals, and our goal difference. None of these columns Goal, goal, goal columns will make up a key because, of course, many matches could have the same score. Um, but by storing all three of these columns, we've introduced the possibility of inconsistencies, right? We've got a draw here which has a non zero goal difference. Clearly, that's wrong. Why is it wrong? Which value is incorrect? Uh, it's not necessarily, you know, did we add instead of subtract or did we mess up the goal? you know, give the home team a goal when we should have given it to the away team or something like that. All right, so we have 
a relationship or a functional dependency between these non-key columns. The home goals and the way goals determine goal difference. I've actually said it's the absolute goal difference, but kind of doesn't really matter here. Um, uh, okay, so one way we could solve this is again, we could decompose this table. We could take that those home goals and away goals columns, create a new table, make it primary key of that table, and take the goal difference away there, like this, and then have a foreign key from the matches table to the scores here. What do we think about this? Do we think this is a good idea, bad idea? Where, who would do something like this? Uh, Bernard, you're getting your head. You, you come back. Stay with me, Bernard. Um, you know, <laughs> I, you'll, you'll see exactly what I'm going to say here. Niraj, can you explain the detailed logical premise for the given displayed ER diagram? Um, I'm not sure. I'll see if we've got time at the end, Niraj, um, because I've still got various things to get through and um, we've got short time left. But if you want to hang around that after, um, I'm happy to chat a bit more. Uh, so Arun, why would I store? Why would I store? You know, so what do we do? We think splitting these out is a good idea. Who who would actually do something like this? No, oh, no added table. No one exactly. <laughs> Rachel, no one. Right. I don't think anyone would do this. Right. You know, in terms of normalization, we could do this, but it feels wrong. Right. Um, yes, this is one way to solve the problem, but it just doesn't really make any sense. Now, something like football matches where there's a, a sort of upper limit or reasonable upper limit to how many goals could be scored by each team, you know, maybe up to about 10 in a normal game. You know, if you include things like penalty shootouts, okay, maybe it could get to 20 or 30 goals per team. But the fact is there aren't that many combinations possible. So we probably could just about do something like this, but in practice, it just it, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, in the real world, you'll have a lot of these kind of compute computations that you need to make. Um, classic example is things like um, details about products people have purchased, either on their sales order or their invoices. So for each product, you want to store the unit price and how many they've bought. And then, of course, you need to know the total they paid as well, which is the unit type price times the quantity. For most businesses, there is basically like an infinite number of these combinations. So creating a separate lookup table of all the combinations of unit price and quantities is just a nonsense and is just unworkable. So in theory, you could do this in practice. It just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So. Um, so some people are saying, you know, uh, things like using a computed column or why would I store? So we don't want to store it because it can get out of sync. And that's probably the biggest issue here. And certainly from normalization perspective, if we update one of the columns, but not the other, there's a mismatch, which is right. Uh, you don't necessarily know. So you need to go back to whoever entered it and figure out what the actual value should be. But secondly, of course, it can lead to, it also means you're storing more data, which has cost and performance implications. Now, a lot of people kind of go, well, disk is cheap. It doesn't matter how much we're storing. And, you know, storing an extra integer column probably isn't going to store, you know, add that much to your data overheads. But last time I checked, every business likes to spend less money, right? The, the lower you can keep your storage costs, the less, the, the more they like it, even if it is a tiny cost. But it's more interesting when it comes to um, like performance. If you are storing those values in the table, well, that table's bigger. If you need to do a full table scan, you need to need read more data, which means it's going to take longer, and so on and so forth. So the more data you're storing, the slower your application can be potentially because you just got to process more information. So, and then some people like Aaron saying, what, what, "Why would you store it?" Well, if we say if we don't store it and say always calculate it. That also has a couple of problems. First up, we need to um, write that calculation. And you know, if you've worked on a lot, any ap non-trivial application, you know, even core common um, approaches, eventually, two people will find a different way to write this. So you know, some people will take calculate that goal difference and just do 
um, the normal difference, you know, home minus way, and other people do the absolute difference. And some people, one person writing that calculation will do it one way, and someone will do it another way. And then again, you've got a mismatch in how these are calculated. Okay, so you've got to um, make sure that people do the calculation in exactly the same way every single time. Even for something obvious and straightforward, like total paid for a product, you just say, oh, it's quantity times price. Well, what about rounding rules? What about um, tax, you know, sales tax rules? What about currency conversions? There might be all these added complications that you need. You just store it, then it's always there and it's always the same result, right? Um, you don't need to worry about that mismatch. The other thing is as well, if you are calculating it at runtime, you're doing more work, which is gonna make your query slower. Now, in this example, it's such a small overhead that you know, you've know you almost certainly got bigger things to worry. The overhead of doing an absolute subtraction is almost minimal. But in some cases, that the calculation could be quite complicated, could be computationally expensive and slow. And if you typically process lots of data, calculating it at runtime might significantly slow your queries down. If you calculate it ahead and store the result, then that can have a performance advantage, right? So, um, you know, Aaron's saying, why would you store? Because it's faster to, your query will be faster um, to store the result rather than calculate every single time at runtime, okay? So, uh, you know, how do we get out of this dilemma? Well, there's a couple of ways, and Vernon's already mentioned one of them, and that's virtual columns. So what these are is they store the formula, not the result. And it's just a metadata thing. So basically, we just say this column is this result, and at runtime, we calculate it. So it's no extra storage, um, and because we're not storing it, we're calculating at runtime, it always stays in sync. So a lot of scenarios, this will be good enough. This will be give you what you need. It's nice and centralized. Everyone accessing the table will see the column. Um, so they'll use it, hopefully at least, rather than writing their own function. Um, and so that is often good enough in the way you need to go. However, um, there may be some situations. First up, this has to be a deterministic function. So if you want something, for example, that's showing somebody's age, you've got their date of birth stored and you want a column showing their age, well, that's not deterministic. It changes every year, right? Um, so you can't do that as a virtual column. Um, also, I say if it's an expensive calculation, it's slow, um, adds noticeable overheads to your queries, you may want to store the result. So if you're storing the result, how do we stop them getting out of sync? Well, we can add a check constraint, right? And ensure the values stay in sync. Again, there's still issues here for non-deterministic values. You need to think kind of carefully about those. What you want. So we're in storing form formula would involve CPU at runtime, right? Yes, correct. And as well, you have to have all the columns that you need to compute on the same table. That is, that's also right. Yes. Yeah. Another important thing to be aware of with virtual columns is you can't combine columns from different tables within uh, within that expression. Okay. Or at least. So again, that's another thing to be aware of. Um, you know, quite often you'll have like um, total paid per order on the order header, which is actually the sum of the individual items from the child table. You, you, yeah, we can't just do that as a sum, unfortunately. So you need to think about things that you handle there. Okay, so we've solved that, right? Okay, um, so we've looked at ways you can solve that. Again, exactly how you solve this and how you address it will depend on your requirements and what you're trying to achieve here. So if we go back uh, to our little RAIM at the start, we saw we, we're saying first three normal forms, the key, you know, first normal form, and that is part of it, but actually there's more to it when it comes to first normal form. You also want to make sure that not only are you enforcing uniqueness, you know, there's no left to right ordering of the columns, and we're storing a single value in each. Uh, Chris Day did actually have a second couple of other additions to that as well, but those are probably the main ones most people need to think about. Um, and then for second normal form, the whole key, does every column that is not part of a primary or unique key rely entirely on every other 
the whole, all the columns in every other primary unique key in the table. If not, you need to split them out into separate tables. And for third normal form, do the columns, all the columns that are not part of any primary or unique key, is there a relationship between those? Um, and how do we resolve that? I'd say when it comes to calculated values in third normal form, sometimes you will find that you will want to store them, but you need to take steps to make sure that you are protected against them getting out of sync. So um, finish up, let's, let's just have a little quiz, a uh, little test to see what we think about this. So let's imagine we've been asked to build a hotel reservation system. So we want to store um, for each hotel, which rooms they've got, the type of the room, you know, is it a single room, a double room, that kind of thing, and the price of each room. So we come up with a table that looks like this. So we've got those four columns on it, and we said the key is the hotel ID and each room, you know, the room number, because each hotel can only have one of each room number. So the question here is, is this table in third normal form? Okay, so what do we think about this? Yes, no, what do we think? Thoughts? Yes, no, Rachel says no. Anyone, anyone else want to take any votes or guesses or thoughts on this? Niraj says, Tido, yes, yes, no, no. Or oh, everyone, everyone's split here, aren't they? Oh, this is great. Well, the short answer is, I don't know, right? And I don't just mean this in the sense that I haven't really thought about it properly. It's actually unknowable. I haven't given you enough information to answer that question, okay? Because we need to know what those functional dependencies are. We need to know what the business rules are to say whether or not a table is in a particular normal form. You know, every now and again, people ask me, you know, is there a tool which will look at a schema and say which how normalized it is? Um, and at least as far as I'm, I'm aware, the answer is no, because you need to inform the tool what all the relationships are, right? Or you need to look at the relationships and the functional dependencies, right? Without answering that, we can't know. So let's let's look at this. So first question here is, is it in first normal form? Well, just by looking at this, we can probably answer that. Looks like we have a single value in each row and column. We've got a unique constraint. Um, there's no ordering on the rows and columns and so on. Next question. Is it in second normal form? Well, we've got a two column key here, right? So we actually need to check a couple of things. First up, it is just about conceivable, it's highly unlikely, but it's possible that one hotel chain custom builds all the hotels to exactly the same shape, right? So every hotel has exactly the same layout. That means room means room 42 in every single hotel is always a single room. It is technically possible that room number determines the room type or there's some other dependency here. It's highly unlikely, but it is in theoretically possible. If that relationship does exist, then we are not in second normal form, okay? Now, when it comes to third normal form, things are a bit more interesting. There is two quite plausible ways a chain could decide to price their rooms. They could say, we're going to price every single room individually, okay? You know, we just make it up as we go along kind of thing. In which case, this table is fine. Or they might have a different rule, and that says the room type determines the price. So a single room is always 75 pounds, euros, dollars, whatever it is. Or a single room in this hotel is always that price, okay? Um, it is very likely that they they could well have that kind of rule. So that's the question we need to answer here. Room type should depend on room number. Should it? You know, uh, why why should room type depend on room number, Rachel? Uh, you know, you know. Bear in mind if we I've only shown hotel one here, we could have hotel two, room forty two, could be a double room in a different um, uh, hotel, right? So it's why why would that manage? So anyway, going back to room type determining price, if that rule did exist, then we would split it out. We'd have a separate table um, storing the room types and their prices. We might have a separate table storing the hotel, the room type and the prices and things like that. So you need to think about the business rules and what they are. And only by knowing what the functional dependencies are, 
can you actually answer whether or not a table is in a particular normal form? So um, finish up, wrap up. Um, so we say normalization. Um, first normal form, as we saw, we want to say that there is one value in each row and column intersection. Um, it is theoretically possible that could be a complex thing, but in general, you want it to be just one thing. It's something that you always operate as a single unit. You know, if you operate on the players of a team as one thing, you always just fetch them all and get them and don't interact on the players individually, arguably the first design would have been okay, but it's pretty unlikely, just one row or thing. Also, there should be no ordering in the columns. We don't say, you know, phone to player one, player two, player three. Whereas if we said a bit more context, like goalkeeper, defender, left winger, right winger, whatever, that actually doesn't have an ordering, we hide context there. And of course, we want constraints to say there are no duplicates. For second normal form, we need to look at partial dependencies. So whenever you have um, compound keys in a table, you need to check, are there columns which depend on part of the primary key or any of the keys for that table? If there are, you need to decompose them and sp split them out. And for third normal form, we're looking at the columns which are not part of any key, okay? And again, the calculated values, there's the whole debate about scoring versus um, calculating at runtime. There are other non-calculated examples of this. You know, we store, we had stadium, city, we could have also had country. So if we had the stadiums table, which had city and then country, well, the city determines the country, you could argue, in which case we would have that third normal form violation. Okay. So there's, it isn't, doesn't just apply to calculated values. Calculated values are just the one that causes the most debate and um, conflict, all right? Um, if you want to know more, here's some, um, some more links. This, this top one is written by a guy called Bill Kent. It was actually written like in 1980 or something like that. It's very old, but it's still very good. Um, I thoroughly recommend it. And it actually covers the first five normal forms. There's two more, fourth and fifth. Well, there's more than that, actually. But um, fourth and fifth, which discuss many-to-many -many relationships. Um, maybe I'll cover those in another day, but we've not got time for um, now. And a database programmer, which is a fantastic blog run by a guy or called Ken Downs. He talks about database design. And there's, you know, if you want to know more about SQL generally, I've got my databases for developers foundations course. So that's completely free. Feel free to check that out. Uh, okay. So any final questions or comments before we wrap up? Because we're, we're just past the hour. So if you need to head off, feel free to head off. For the rest of you, I'm going to stick around for a little bit um, and answer some more questions. Um, so I'll stop the recording now and say, really hope you enjoyed this. More importantly, I hope you learned something and hope to see you again next time. All right.